What's up guys, welcome back to The Educated Bar Fly. Today we are going to be talking about creating our own cocktails. This is a video that I've really wanted to do for a long time. I'm glad that I'm starting to get around to it and it's a question that I get from a lot of people. Uh, when you are first starting out in making cocktails, especially doing your own, um, it can be very overwhelming. There's just so many different possibilities. How do you narrow it, narrow it all down? Well, luckily for everybody, there are a couple of different methods. I'm gonna talk about all three methods but I'm only gonna show you one, and then in subsequent videos, we'll do the other two methods. That being said, they are also, these methods are also very close to one another. They're very similar uh, approaches, but there are some key differences. So just as a trigger warning, I'm gonna be talking a little bit ahead of the cocktail here. So if you guys are not interested in it, click the timestamp that I put below, and then you can go straight to the cocktail. Um, I'm really addressing the people that really want to kind of figure out how to kind of cut through the noise, uh, you know, really take their inspiration and make a great cocktail out of it. So the three main approaches to creating your own cocktail uh, would be, uh, the first one would be, and the easiest I think would be getting an old cocktail book and recreating an existent recipe and trying to improve on it. This is something that is really big right now, especially in this revitalization of tiki cocktails. So uh, a lot of old books um, put forth a ton of recipes and not all of them were good. We tend to idealize these old books because they have been around for so long and they have given birth to some truly, truly next level cocktails uh, like Old Fashions and Manhattans and Sazeracs and those ones that have been around for a hundred years. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that most people who created those cocktail books would do a dozen really fantastic cocktails and then they'd do about 300 really not so great cocktails. And the thing is, is that you can take one of those old um, you know, kind of cocktail, uh, kind of cocktail recipes and then rework them. The thing is, is that we have a lot of technology that they didn't have in the 1800s or the early 1900s nowadays. And you can apply those techniques into uh, making better balanced drinks. The second way uh, that we're gonna, that you can approach this, and this is uh, something that I'm gonna do in this video, is what the guys at Death & Company called a plug and play or a Mr. Potato Head. Basically what you do is you take a template for a cocktail and you switch out the ingredients. A really good example of this would be the old fashioned. So if we break down what an old fashioned is, you know that it is bitters, uh, it's about a quarter ounce of sugar, uh, you've got some type of water in there, whether that's coming from the ice or water itself, you got a main spirit and you've got some citrus zest. Uh, and so you can break that down into its components. So the bitters can be anything. It can be like dashes of bitters, or it can be, um, or it can be uh, some type of amaro, some type of bitter amaro like Campari or uh, amaro Montenegro or uh, uh, Angostura amaro. Uh, the main spirit can be anything you want, as long as it's two ounces. It, it can be whatever you want, and you then you can break down that two ounce pour. So you could do a half an ounce of one ingredient, ounce and a half of another, or you could do equal parts of one ounce to break that down. And then your sugar content can come in the form of aromatized wine. It can come in the form of sugar. It can do whatever you want. So the thing is, is that if you, actually you guys should go and watch uh, our video on uh, Cocktail Codex, which talks a little bit about the uh, Death & Company approach to this. Uh, Cocktail Codex is a book that has broken down all of the different cocktail templates, like the six cocktail templates that sort of make up the root cocktails that gave birth to the whole multitude of cocktails that we have these days. Um, so uh, definitely go and, and check that out. And I'm not gonna talk about it in this cocktail video because it's gonna take too long. Um, so that's the second approach. And then the third approach uh, would be uh, using inspiration from something like some type of abstract inspiration, whether that's like a song or a piece of art or like uh, something that evokes emotion in you and you wanna try to match that emotion in a cocktail. Now this takes a lot of cocktail know-how because you could actually use the first approach of taking the template of an existing cocktail from a book and then sort of using that as your inspiration. Um, and then, or you could do a thing where you take a template from one of the, you know, six cocktail templates, uh, like a daiquiri, like, so like, it would be like a sour or a, an old fashioned or like a martini or Manhattan spec, um, and then use that as your base. Uh, but you do, if you're doing something that's that abstract, which is like, 
you know, inspired by a movie or inspired by a song, it's really helpful to have a lot of knowledge of flavor profiles. And so that approach kind of takes a little bit of time and experimentation. Those cocktails tend to take the longest to create because you're really experimenting with flavor profiles. And if you don't really have a good understanding of what goes with what, um, then you it can take a little longer. That being said, there's a couple of books that I like, which is the Flavor Matrix and also the Flavor Bible, which can help you to understand very surprising uh, flavors that you wouldn't un like necessarily uh, know that they go together. Okay, let's get into making the cocktail finally. So today, um, what I thought I would do is take the template of an existing cocktail and, cre and I've created a cocktail around it. Uh, we're gonna be doing a Caipirinha spec. Um, which is basically like a type of uh, a type of sour, um, uh, and this drink is called a caipirissimo because I'm using a little Italian uh, amaro and I'm using uh, a little bit of uh, uh, mezcal here. And then, if you guys want to tune in at the end of the video, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the uh, about the aperitivo, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the mezcal and just kind of give you some specs on the bottles. But first, let's make the cocktail. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a um, a lime, and I'm going to cut it into quarters. Which some of you viewers might call a lemon. Who would call this a lemon? It's a lime. A certain places in the world. They oh, somebody, call that lemon, really? Somebody commented about that, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then when I was in Africa, they kept saying lemon, even though it's like, it's combined. It's lime. So then it's what do they call a lemon? A lemon? Just everything's a lemon. Yeah, everything's a lemon. Well, it's maybe. Just, I guess green lemon and yellow lemon. I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a little bit odd, but okay. Um, so then we're going to take uh, our lime wedges and we're just going to place them in here. I like to try and put them peel side down. So when you muddle them, you don't get too many of the bitter notes. And then what I'm going to do is take a little uh, of uh, caster sugar. I'm going to do one bar spoon of caster sugar. You can also do a sugar cube. I just didn't have any on hand. Uh, but you do like a bar spoon of caster sugar. Uh, and then we're going to do a half an ounce of simple syrup. I know what you're thinking, and no, it's not too much sugar. Then we're gonna do... You uh, never have too much sugar. Yeah, you can never have, well, you can, but we don't. Uh, we're gonna do one ounce of mezcal. And then we're gonna do one ounce of the uh, select aperitivo. Oh, a new bottle, I haven't even cracked it open yet. What? I love that sound of the cracking bottle. Well, the cracking cap. And then it's one ounce of the aperitivo. And then what we're gonna do is we are going to muddle our lime. And we're gonna just add one very little small dash of pebble ice just to get the chill going and just to start the dilution. And we can actually shake that until those pebbles are completely gone. Now, I think I'm gonna say something about pebble ice here that might get all of the scientists on YouTube kind of angry, but I'm gonna, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna venture something here. I'm gonna ask a question a scientific ice question of you guys because I haven't tested it. And then what we're gonna do is just, we're gonna, just gonna do like an ungated pour. Some people call this a dirty dump of everything into our glass. And then we're going to pack it in pebble ice. I like to kind of press the pebble ice in. Now, I have been getting a lot of comments about my pebble ice cocktails. There's a lot of people that just say, that's too much ice. And I want to refute that a little bit in this video because it, this is actually not too much ice. The thing is, is that a lot people see a lot of ice going into a cocktail and they automatically think that it's going to be over diluted. And that is not exactly true. The thing is, is that when you shake a cocktail with ice, you're trying to bring that down to temperature. And when you bring the spirits down to temperature, when you pack it in ice, actually the more ice you pack it in, the less dilution you're gonna get. Because the ice, because when you get the, a cocktail down to temperature, you're actually getting it down to below the freezing point of water. 
And so when you pack it in ice, all of the ice that's sitting below is serving to keep that alcohol chilled now. For longer, that's the key. Well, it's keeping it chilled longer. Now, here's the thing. You've got the forces of nature working on the glass. So this is melting actively, right? You're getting the heat. Basically, the cold cup is trying to chill the air around the, the glass, right? So that is causing dilution. And then any ice exposed to the air is trying to chill the air. And so that is causing dilution. So it is actively melting. The thing is, when you pack this more in, like when you pack this in more crushed ice, right? Or pebble ice for that matter, uh, you're keeping it colder longer. Now, that is true 100% for like a cocktail that you would stir and pour over a large rock, like an old fashioned. That's, it's true for anything you shake and strain and put ice in. The question is, is it true for pebble ice cocktails? Because the thing is, is that when I do pebble ice cocktails, I control the, dil I'm basically thinking about the dilution it's gonna have ahead of time. And that's why I just put a little dash of crushed ice in there. The thing is, is that that little dash of crushed ice probably isn't enough to get it down to temperature. That said, it is starting the dilution process and it is, but it's not over diluting it so that it can sit on crushed ice. And then as it sits on crushed ice, this ice is going to chill it and kind of eventually bring it down to temperature. So that's what I have to say about that. The thing is, is that also this nice ice cap on top is really, really important for the visual of the cocktail. Um, I really don't like it when I see a crushed ice cocktail that just has like ice below the rim here, and it's just not very pleasing to the eye. And so this is a really nice way to present the cocktail. You just have like the, you know, different colors in here that are represented the green from the lime, and then you've got the red cocktail, and then you've got the white ice cap on top. Now, of course, because this is the Educated Barfly, I forgot my straw, so I'm gonna go root around over there to find one of my Surfside sips. Obviously, this is too long for the glass, but I'm not being picky here. I just want to give you the tasting notes here. Okay, so let's let's taste it with our overly large Surfside sip straw. I don't know. I, I think Andrew is going to be really happy about this because it's just like a very nice commercial for his glass straws, and they are awesome straws. I gotta say. So this is what you get when you muddle lime and you have the sugar. You get this nice balanced tartness with the sweetness of the sugar. But when you muddle the lime peel, it actually, it actually puts out the essential oils of the lime into the liquid so you get this beautiful, just like amazingly good lime flavor. Uh, you get the bitterness of the aperitivo and then just a little bit of smoke from the mezcal. This particular mezcal is not super smoky and it is very citrusy on your palate as well. So you have uh, that nice sort of balance in there, but it's like between the bitterness and the and the smoke. And also the select, if you're tasting the select on its own, you get like a lot of like uh, citrus elements, kind of potpourri elements. Uh, it's really, it's, it's really uh, smooth and kind of silky on the palate, but then also it's the, the bitterness is kind of broken up with almost a bergamot kind of style flavor. And it goes really well in this cocktail. Uh, so there it is, my friends. Uh, the, uh, the Kuiperissimo. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, bottles. A lot of people have been asking me to go back to the Workhorse Spirits or make like a volume two of Workhorse Spirits. So I just thought like, when I use particular brands, I should tell you guys why I'm using those particular brands. Some of them have proprietary flavors and some of them don't. Um, you know, for instance, there's a lot of aperitivos in the market. So why did I pick the Select Aperitivo, particularly for this cocktail? Uh, so let's talk about this Select. Uh, Select was created in Venice in the 1920s by two brothers at the, uh, well, okay, it's called the Pilla Distillery. I'm saying that in a very American way. I don't know how the Italians would pronounce that. If you are an Italian, please write the pronunciation in the comments. I would have greatly appreciated it, but it's P-I-L-L-A. Uh, and it is a, uh, it has a, a bunch of different botanicals in it, uh, obviously some orange peel. Uh, and rhubarb is also in the base. Um, it has got this really bright red color. It's really, really nicely, like kind of deep and bright red. Uh, I brought a little tasting glass out so I can give you some tasting notes on it. Um, and you know, it's very much in the style of your like aperitivos, like Aperol or Campari or something. So let's taste it. So first impressions, it's got like, 
It's funny because it's not quite as bitter as Campari, but it's and it and it is and it has some sweetness to it, but it's not as sweet and light as Aperol, and it's not as bitter as Campari. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. It has a very kind of silky uh, mouthfeel, which is really nice. Um, I can get some real bitter orange right off the top, along with like, some potpourri flavors. It's like a nice deep bitterness, but it doesn't linger. It's a pretty short on the palate. Um, you know, that, that oranginess is really what, uh, exemplifies an aperitivo. You know, that's something that like, you know, there's a bitter orange in a lot of Amari and aperitivos, but for the aperitivos, I think that's kind of the signature flavor is like that bitter, bitter orange. Um, yes, I like it a lot. It's very good. So there's the short specs on this. Marius had suggested that maybe we do some like deeper dives into bottles in some Barfly free pour episode, so we may be doing that. Okay, I'm not washing my palate as I taste either, so just FYI. Uh, Del Maguey, it's, 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 it's spelled Magui, it's pronounced Maguey. Uh, it was created in 1995 uh, by an artist, a very renowned artist named uh, Ron Cooper, who was uh, uh, a guy who was born in Ojai, like, you know, California guy. Um, and basically what he did was he was the first one to bring an organic process spirit to the market and it's this mezcal. Um, I really like this mezcal because it is very lightly, light, it's light in flavor. It's not, it doesn't hit you over the head with the smoke and then it has some nice light citrusy notes to it. It's very, very mixable. This is my go-to bottle and it's, an entry, it's at an entry level price somewhere around 35 bucks, um, give or take. You can find it cheaper, you can find it more expensive depending on where you shop or where in the world you are. Uh, and uh, this is pretty widely available, but I'm not exactly sure how many countries it's in. A lot of the challenge of this channel is that things aren't available everywhere. So I'm gonna give you some tasting notes so that if you guys need to um, switch the bottle out for something that's available in your area, you'll be able to do that. So all mezcal has this really nice miner minerality on the finish, and some of them are very mineral in flavor, and some of them are less mineral in flavor. This was really nice is that you've got a tiny bit of smoke, a little bit of heat. It's it, it's got that minerality, but then it also has these nice light kind of citrus and sort of floral notes to it. It's funny because you can even get that minerality on the nose, you know. Um, As it hits your palate, it goes in really clean and then it kind of opens up on the back of your tongue. Um, it is really, really pleasing. And this is something that I've used for a very long time and I really like it. It goes very good into most of my kind of citrus kind of based cocktails. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean this is the only mezcal I use. It's not by a long shot, but it is one of the main ones that I use. Um, you know, the thing that's cool about what Ron Cooper did is that, you know, kind of through his deep, he kind of created a deep relationship with the Zapotec Mexican Indians um, in these remote villages in Oaxaca uh, to kind of create these uh, mezcals and using these kind of ancient techniques, these ancient organic techniques. It's something that nobody had done up until he had done it. Uh, so it is, a, um, it is a leader kind of in that sort of style of spirit making. All right, guys, there you have it. So if you like our channel, please hit like and subscribe and check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash educatedbarfly. Check out Barfly Free Pour. Uh, we do interesting content there. It's our new channel and we're really proud of it and we're really happily creating content for it. And I guess I'll see you guys on another time.